everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. Thank you all so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to today's case. Today's case has been on my mind literally all week. Like, I just cannot stop watching videos about it. I can't stop reading about it or talking to people about it. Literally, like, any second I get, I tell people the story because it's just absolutely frightening and it just brings up a very important conversation that everyone should have with the young people in their lives. Today, we're going to be talking about 12-year-old Micaela Ortega and how she became friends with another young girl on Facebook who actually turned out to be an online predator. For those in La Familia who have children, nieces, nephews, or just any young person in their life who is on social media, please speak to them about the dangers lurking on all social media platforms. It is just absolutely crucial to have these very important conversations with them, so I will leave some resources down below about how to approach those talks and how parents or guardians can monitor their children's social social media accounts to ensure that they're being safe online. Social media is just a whole different world nowadays where people can hide their evil intentions behind a screen and Micaela's case shows us exactly that. Evil isn't only lurking out and about in the world, it can creep right into our homes and right into the hands of our young loved ones. There is a lot of information to go over. I really appreciate you guys being here and helping me spread awareness on this case and on this very important topic. You guys are the best familia ever. I know I say that in every single video but I just can never show you guys enough appreciation so thank you thank you thank you for being so supportive and with that let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Micaela. Micaela Aldana Ortega was born on August 4th, 2003 to her parents, Monica and Claudio, in Bahia Blanca, Argentina. Her parents separated on good terms shortly after she was born, so it was just Micaela and her mom living together. Her grandma would step in to help take care of her as well, since Monica did work a lot to make ends meet. Plus, her grandmother lived right next door, so it was just very convenient for her to kind of just like hop over, check in on Micaela, and just show support to Monica. Micaela did still see her her dad, but she would spend most of her time with Monica. Micaela was described as being a very kind, happy, friendly, and just loving person. She loved showing affection to her family, specifically to her mom. They were like a really cute mother-daughter duo. You know, she was always hugging her mom, giving her kisses, wanting to brush her hair, and she just loved like physical touch. They just had a very cute relationship. Of course, they did, you know, butt heads. I feel like that's normal when you're kind of growing up and going into your teen phase. So as Micaela started to get older, she started to play really loud music from her room and Monica wasn't really like a fan of the type of music that she was listening to. She kind of described Micaela's taste in music to be weird because she liked to listen to punk and rock music. Her older stepbrother actually listened to that same kind of music. So because her stepbrother and Micaela were so close, Micaela also started listening to that music and she would basically just blast it all over the house. Monica would have to shout at her to turn down the music, but Micaela would kind of just ignore her and keep playing it. It wasn't really that big of a deal. It was just something that Monica kind of noticed was changing about Micaela, you know. She started to explore with her taste in music and also started to be, you know, a little bit rebellious. Now, when she grew up, Micaela knew 100% that she wanted to help others, so she had her mind set on one of two things. She either wanted to become a vet and help animals, or she wanted to become a special education teacher. One of her best friends, actually had surgery and had to use a wheelchair. So Micaela decided to step in and help her friend by pushing the wheelchair around school, helping her get her backpack, get her books, and things like that. She would also help cheer up her friend by telling her jokes and just making her laugh. So she was just a really good support system for this friend who had to use a wheelchair. And the friend's mother was just so happy that her daughter had a good friend to care for her in school and said, quote, something that was tragic, Micaela turned it into something happy, end quote. So I feel like that just kind of shows you, you know, what type of person Micaela was at, you know, such a young age. All she really wanted to do was help people. As I mentioned, as Micaela started to get a little bit older, you know, when Micaela turned 12 years old, she was beginning to go through puberty. And this is when she and her mom really began to kind of like butt heads. Micaela wanted to be treated like an adult. You know, she wanted to wear makeup. She wanted to go out by herself. And she would complain to her friends about how her mom was 
was overprotective and didn't even let her go to the store at the corner by herself or let her get to school on her own. You know, she just felt like her parents didn't trust her and that they were kind of hovering over her. One of the main issues that they were having is that Micaela wanted to have a boyfriend and her mom said no. Now, she did have like a boy who was like a friend. So it wasn't like a boyfriend. It was more of just like an innocent thing. But Micaela wanted to officially become boyfriend and girlfriend. But again, Monica just would not allow it. She was just having a really hard time trying to get Micaela to follow her rules and says that she did struggle with her when Micaela would get into like these bad moods. Monica just wanted her daughter to focus on other things, you know, to focus on school and her friends and on her future instead of focusing on boys. So it was a very difficult topic for them to kind of, you know, maneuver. And it was just very tough on both of them. Micaela was just kind of going through that teen phase that I'm sure we're all familiar with where you think you know what's best for you and you think your parents are lame and you think they're kind of annoying and you just argue with them for, you know, not letting you do certain things. Monica and Micaela would even bicker about, you know, very meaningless things like what was for breakfast or what they were going to have for dinner. And apparently Micaela would always kind of have like a smart answer for everything. To this, Monica said, quote, I noticed she changed a lot from her music to her way of speaking. She would ask for things that were impossible for me to accept. I didn't know how to help her. Suddenly, she wanted a piercing or a tattoo. So yeah, some days were great between them. Other days ended in fights. And again, I feel like a lot of people make it seem like Micaela was some type of like bratty girl, but I don't think that's the case at all. I really just think she was a 12 year old girl just trying to figure life out, trying to become her own person while, you know, still living with her mom and having her mom, you know, trying to guide her. So I definitely think your teen years are such a difficult time. And I think we've all been there. You know, we've all been a little rebellious. There was this one incident that happened on Friday, April 22nd, 2016, where Monica caught Micaela in a lie. She saw her near the house with her like boyfriend, the one that I mentioned earlier. Despite being told that she wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend and when Monica called her, you know, asking, where are you? Micaela said that she was with her aunt. Monica was like, well, no, I'm literally looking at you right now standing with a boy. So you're lying to me. And because of that, she ended up taking away Micaela's cell phone. This, of course, did lead to an argument because Micaela was practically glued to her cell phone and she would spend a lot of time on it texting her friends. So Monica taking away her cell phone was a very big deal. Although she did take away her cell phone, Micaela did have a tablet that she was able to go on to watch videos. And I believe she was able to go on the internet with this tablet, but she was not able to text. So that was that. Her phone was taken away and Micaela pretty much spent the rest of this Friday in her room. Nighttime came around and although they did get into an argument earlier, Micaela still went into her mom's bedroom, said goodnight, told her she loved her, and then headed to bed. The next morning on Saturday, Micaela's family was met with something that seemed straight out of a movie. The morning of April 23rd, 2016, Monica got up early for work and since it was a Saturday and Micaela didn't have any commitments until that afternoon, she left without waking Micaela up and just kind of let her sleep in. At around 10 o'clock in the morning, Monica called her mom, who again lived next door, and asked her if she could go over to wake Micaela up. Well, when Micaela's grandma walked into her bedroom, she saw what looked like Micaela under the bed sheets. But when she got closer to kind of like gently wake her up, she realized Micaela was not in bed. Instead, the grandmother found a bundle of clothes arranged to resemble a body under the sheets along with a note. Her grandma immediately called Monica right away and Monica left work and rushed straight over to the house to see what was going on. On the drive there, she was thinking to herself, what the heck is going on? Like, why would Micaela not be in her house? Why would she not be in bed? Where could Micaela be? When Monica arrived, she saw the note on Micaela's bed where she wrote, quote, Mom, forgive me, but I felt I had to leave because I am not a good daughter and there's a lot of reasons I left. One, again, I am not a good daughter. Two, I began smoking weed. Three, because you want to take me to that place where Carlito's son is. I'm going to be okay, Mom, I promise. I'm going to be with a female friend from white. I don't want you to be sad because of me because I made this decision and because I will be okay. I love you all so much and I will miss you so much. 
end quote. Now, White is actually this neighborhood called Ingeniero White, which according to Monica is not the safest area because it has a lot of crime, drugs, and prostitution. As for the part of the letter that says, because you want to take me to where Carlito's son is, I'm not entirely sure what that means. Maybe it means taking her to a stricter school or like a place for troubled teens. I'm not really sure. I was not able to confirm that detail. Now, when Monica read this letter, her eyes widened and her heart raced as she read the note. She had no idea what was going on. Micaela had no friends that lived in white, so who did she run away with? Red flags immediately started to go off and Monica realized that only a few things were missing from her bedroom. Micaela's white hair straightener, her ID, her pink backpack, and only a handful of clothes were missing. Monica's mind immediately started going into so many different scenarios, but she gathered herself and immediately started searching for her daughter. She began by contacting all of her friends, but no one knew anything. The boyfriend that she was with the day before also said that he didn't know anything either, and he even handed his phone over to police and was like, listen, go through my phone, do whatever you gotta do, like I swear I'm not involved. Involved. He even began texting Micaela saying, oh my gosh, your family's looking for you. The police are here. Where are you? But received no response. Now, when Monica reported Micaela's disappearance to the police, thankfully, they did not resort to like the common statement heard in similar cases of you have to wait 48 hours to report someone as missing. So thankfully, they didn't say that to Monica and the rest of the family. However, they weren't really too helpful at the beginning. For example, they only printed a couple of missing posters, which which Monica says were printed in absolutely terrible quality, that they were in black and white, and you couldn't even really see Micaela clearly in the photo because everything just looked really blurry. She asked police if they were able to, you know, make some copies in color because she felt like people would see Micaela's photo better, but police told her no because they didn't have enough money to do that. When Monica asked if there was camera footage that they could look at from the streets near the home, police said no because the street cameras don't even work. So she just felt like there was a complete lack of urgency and government resources to assist in Micaela's case. So because of this, Monica and the rest of the family started to think of their own ways to look for her and kind of solve this case by themselves. However, you know, they're not detectives, they're not police officers, so they had no idea where to start. Luckily, there were a few investigators that did truly feel sorry for Monica's family and sorry for, you know, how the police were not helping. And they decided to kind of pitch in with their own money and with their own resources to help the family. Now, really, the only clue that everyone had was the neighborhood that Micaela mentioned. But when police went with the family to search in this neighborhood, they found no signs of Micaela. On April 26, 2016, the family organized a march to spread Micaela's name around the city. People carried canvases that read, Mika, come back and Mika, we are looking for you. They were also carrying photos of her and, you know, signs that they would put up on businesses or street signs and everyone just walked together with Micaela's family to show support. Micaela's dad, Claudio, spoke out at the march addressing Micaela and said, quote, the entire city of Bahia Blanca is aware of what's happening, so call 911 and everything will be done quickly, end quote. At this point, you know, the family was still holding on to hope that Micaela was safe, that she really was just with a friend, kind of avoiding her parents and avoiding rules and avoiding all of this, but that she was okay, that she was safe, and that she would come back. The family organized a total of 10 marches to ensure that Micaela's disappearance remained in the faces of authorities. That way, they wouldn't be able to just ignore the families and kind of push her case to the side. So the search continued, and there were actually two people who saw Micaela the morning she disappeared. One was a neighbor named Alicia, who saw her walking alone from her kitchen window and thought to herself that it was weird that Micaela was walking all by herself. The other person to see her was actually a teacher at Micaela's school named Brenda. Now, she wasn't her direct direct teacher. She was just like another teacher at the school, but she recognized Micaela as one of the students. So she says that she saw Micaela walking with a man and said, quote, we crossed paths and I looked at her to greet her, but she didn't look at me. I didn't see his face, but it just seemed to me like he wasn't a kid from school, end quote. Now, when the family and the community heard this witness statement, they started to worry even more because who was this guy Micaela was walking with? I mean, at first they thought that she did run away with another 
female friend like how she had left in her note but now that someone had seen her walking with an unknown man they were starting to really freak out unfortunately 13 days passed without much movement in the case that was until security footage from one of the very few working cameras in the city and from a company security cameras showed Micaela indeed walking with a tall and thin man Monica said that her heart stopped when she saw this footage because she could tell that Micaela didn't know this person by her body language she could also tell that her daughter had no idea where she was walking to and how the man in the footage was basically guiding Micaela you can see in one part of the footage Micaela kind of starts to walk another way and the guy either tells her like no come this way or kind of motions to her and Micaela corrects herself and starts following the guy so because of that Monica is like I truly believe my daughter had no idea where they were going now these clips began appearing all over the news because investigators shared it with the public in hopes that someone would recognize the man from his walk or from his movements because the camera was pretty grainy and you really couldn't see anybody's faces clearly so they were hoping someone would see this and be like oh I know that outfit or I know that walk or I know that you know silhouette but unfortunately there really were no leads until a month later and this clue actually came from Monica she knew that they were going to find some type of answers in Mikaela's Facebook you know she was always glued to her phone and Monica just had a gut feeling that if she entered Mikaela's Facebook account she would get a clue so she started doing some digging and that's when she found out that Mikaela actually had four Facebook accounts two that she made when she was younger and had forgotten the passwords to one that she used for only her family and school friends and then another where she had 600 friends who were all strangers and where she blocked all of her family on so her mother had no idea that Mikaela had this Facebook account with 600 strangers added as her friends Monica knew that this Facebook account was the answer however they couldn't access it they contacted Facebook to help log in but Facebook didn't reply until weeks later thankfully a US based organization called NECMEC which I've mentioned on this channel before NECMEC stands for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and they actually stepped in and assisted the family with getting into this Facebook account with the help from this amazing organization the authorities were able to access data from Mikaela's Facebook and they discovered that one of Mikaela's Facebook friends who she was messaging had an IP address in Ingeniero White which again is the neighborhood Mikaela mentioned in her goodbye note so this was an incredible lead and it makes me so happy to hear how NECMEC is helping people all over the world and that's why these organizations are just so amazing so I will definitely link them down below so you guys can read more about them and I'm also going to be making a donation to them on behalf of La Familia. Okay so this person that Micaela was messaging on Facebook was named La Rochi the River. I'm not really sure what this name means but this account appeared to belong to a girl around the same age of Micaela and through their Facebook messages it was clear that they had gotten to know each other and Micaela even confided in this girl about the arguments that she was having at home. Now they hadn't been speaking for that long they started messaging in February of that same year but they would talk a lot. Now this Rochi girl was like this super cool girl that had chill parents and told Micaela that she was allowed to go out that she was allowed to have a boyfriend wear makeup and basically do everything that Micaela wanted to do but wasn't allowed to do at home. The last conversation between Micaela and this Facebook account was Micaela asking her if she had space at her house because she got into an argument with her mom. If you recall Micaela still had a tablet after her mom took away her cell phone so she could still access Facebook and that's how she was able to talk to Rochi. Rochi replied to this message and said that she did have some space and said the name of the neighborhood she lived in but Micaela told her that she didn't really know how to get there on her own. Rochi was like okay I have an idea one of my cousins can go pick you up. To this Micaela said that she would think about it but then shortly after ended up telling Rochi that yes her cousin could come past for her and she told Rochi where she would be waiting. Rochi told her that her cousin was quote poor so they would have to walk back to her home but that if they took a shortcut through some train tracks in the outskirts that they would get back to her sooner. Rochi asked her how will you be dressed and Micaela said I'll be wearing black pants, a pink backpack, and a blue sweater. The last message that she sent was aw look at what you're doing for me 
I adore you. Now, this conversation was very surprising to Monica. She had no idea who this Rochi girl was, how Mikaela met her, why Mikaela confided so much in her. I mean, it was all just so scary and confusing to know that this random girl and her cousin were most likely the last person to see Mikaela. Now, in these messages, Rochi gave Mikaela her home address, so investigators immediately headed over to this address to hopefully find Mikaela there. A judge approved a search warrant for the address, and when authorities arrived at the house, they were not met with a young teenage girl named Rochi. Instead, they were met with a 26-year-old man named Jonathan Omar Luna. Of course, this was incredibly shocking, and investigators went inside and began searching all over the home. While some investigators were searching for evidence, other investigators started speaking to Jonathan and to his girlfriend who he lived with. Yes, he had a girlfriend named Maria who was actually 57 years old, and she told police that she knew Jonathan had something to do with Mikaela's disappearance because when she saw the security footage of Mikaela and this thin, tall man on the news, she immediately recognized that thin man to be Jonathan. She already had a suspicious interaction with him the day Mikaela disappeared, but seeing the camera footage just really put all of the pieces together for her. She said that the day Mikaela disappeared, Jonathan came home soaking wet and with a cut or like some type of injury to his lip. Maria was confused as to why the, her boyfriend was coming home soaking wet, so she asked him, you know, what happened? And Jonathan told her that it was nothing, that he only robbed a girl's cell phone, and that the guy she was with hit him. But his behavior was just really weird. Like, Maria just had a gut feeling that there was more to the story, so she said, did you hurt her? And he said no. Again, Maria insisted and said, did you kill her? Jonathan then got very angry at her and threatened to kill her and send someone to kill her children if she didn't drop it. Now, Maria had children from a previous relationship and they didn't live with them, but still, like, she was very scared of Jonathan because, I mean, he was literally threatening to kill her children if she continued to ask him questions. Besides that interaction that occurred the day Mikaela disappeared, Maria says that Jonathan had been acting very, very weird the days after. That around 15 days before police showed up to the house, he told her that it was weird that police hadn't found, quote, the missing girl. Maria says that when Jonathan said that, she knew that he was involved. You know, why is he so worried about this missing girl on TV? Why is he saying, oh, it's weird they haven't found her? Like, why is he making these comments and just kind of inserting himself into this case? Now, the reason why she says she didn't report Jonathan is because she claims that he was abusive to her. She said, quote, he always hit me. The last time I couldn't get out of bed, I thought he damaged my sciatica nerve. She confided in one of her neighbors, Graciela, about the abuse, and Graciela Graciela spoke to police and said that it was more than once that an ambulance had to come because of how bad the abuse was. Graciela described Jonathan as someone who, quote, doesn't like to work and who is always on his cell phone or with female friends while Maria works, end quote. Other people also chimed in to speak about Jonathan's character and they said that Jonathan never showered and that he always appeared kind of dirty. He previously worked in rural areas doing, you know, manual labor and he studied up until the sixth grade. Another neighbor named Carlos said that Jonathan kind of turned into a hermit after Micaela's disappearance gained media attention. Now, the reason Jonathan was kind of hiding and kind of being on the down low wasn't only because he had something to do with Micaela's disappearance, but it's actually because he was hiding from the police because he had escaped prison. Yeah, this man was a convicted criminal and he was currently on the run. He was actually serving a five-year sentence for stealing a cell phone at knife point from a young woman and he actually escaped escaped during a 24-hour temporary leave, which was approved by a judge. The judge granted him this temporary leave so that he could go visit his friends and his family, and because he had really good behavior in jail, and because he believed that Jonathan didn't pose a risk to society, he was only granted the 24-hour release under the conditions of not leaving the city, not consuming any alcohol, or any drugs. Now, these outings are meant to help inmates whose sentences are coming to an end reintegrate back into society, but obviously in most cases like Jonathan's, the inmates don't return. Like they're like, yeah, like I'll agree to the temporary release, like I'll follow the rules, but then they end up
up just fleeing and sometimes aren't caught again. So yeah, I know a lot of people have, you know, their own opinions when it comes to these temporary releases. A lot of people feel like criminals shouldn't get that right, you know, that they should remain in prison until the day they are free. Other people feel like it's a good thing that they do get these temporary releases because again, it does allow them to like reintegrate back into society slowly and kind of get used to the outside world again. But it's frustrating to hear situations like this where someone takes advantage of this temporary release and ends up fleeing, going on the run, and then committing another crime. So besides being a criminal, Jonathan was also just very creepy. He would spend a lot of time with his 15-year-old neighbor and he expressed his desire to be sexually intimate with her. According to his girlfriend Maria, he would basically spend all day and night on Facebook. It was later discovered that he actually had four different Facebook accounts, one of them being Rochi the River, which was again the young girl who Micaela was supposedly messaging with. On this Rochi the River account, he had more than 1,600 friends, with 90% of these online friends being young female minors. He had countless chats with these girls, you know, he would start chatting with them on Facebook Messenger, and then the conversation would move to WhatsApp. It's just so disturbing to know how he had all these Facebook accounts and just all these fake profiles. It's really sad and scary how Micaela thought that she was speaking to another young girl who she could relate to and, you know, confide in, but instead she was talking to this creepy criminal. Now, detectives believe that Jonathan used the fights that Micaela had with her mom in his favor. You know, Micaela was always complaining about how her mom was very strict, how they would get into these fights, how her mom wouldn't let her wear makeup or have a boyfriend. So Jonathan decided to use all of that to gain Micaela's trust by pretending to be Rochi, who was this young, cool teenager who had a boyfriend who could wear makeup, to kind of like make Micaela want to be her and to want to basically go live with her because of how cool her life was. Now, going back to the search of Jonathan's home, police did find a couple of items belonging to Micaela. They found her tablet, her sweater, a Hello Kitty purse, and they also found her white hair straightener. So with this, the Facebook messages, and basically just everything else, Jonathan was arrested and taken into custody. In custody, he told police he knew where Micaela was, and when they asked him how he knew that, he basically just smirked, and when they asked if he killed her, all he said was that he tried to rob her, and he hit her, but she tried defending herself, and she accidentally fell and hit herself on something. That's the story that he was going with for a while, but eventually he changed the story and told police the truth. Jonathan said that the real reason he killed Micaela is because she didn't want to have sex him. After this, he then told police some details about where he left Micaela's body. Now, before we get into that, let's move over to Monica's perspective. Earlier that day before Jonathan was arrested, Monica had met with a man named Marcos Dario Herrero, who helps families search for their missing loved ones with his bloodhound dog named Duke. Along with Duke, there are 10 other dogs who also join in on the search and Marcos's trained team and together they work to find bodies, clues, or any evidence that can help families find their missing loved ones. So Monica contacted him and collected items from Micaela's bedroom to help the dogs track her scent. They collected an old band-aid that she left behind, hair from her hairbrush, and one of her undergarments. The dog Duke actually took them exactly to the spots where Micaela was seen on camera. From there, Duke kept guiding the team and they ended up walking a lot. They took a few breaks on this walk, but the team said that they couldn't believe how much they were walking. They began following Duke at 10.30 in the morning and Duke kept walking with them until 6.30 p.m. At that time, the team decided that it was getting very dark. They had been walking all day, so they decided to kind of start packing up and just regroup the next day. However, that wasn't really necessary because as they were packing up and getting ready to go home, police were at Jonathan's home, they arrested him, and then we know the rest of the details. So once the search team learned that someone had been arrested and that this person had confessed to killing Micaela and also gave police details about where her body could be found, the team and the dog Duke headed back out to the area that Jonathan mentioned. Duke walked around 10 kilometers past some train tracks until eventually leading them to Micaela's body. It was very hard to get to her body because there was a lot of spikes in the area and wires that they had to go over and bushes with thorns all over the place, so it was very intense terrain. Micaela was found in an open field with her wrist and ankles tied together. Her face was beaten and her white t-shirt was wrapped around her neck, indicating that she had been strangled to death. 
thankfully, she didn't have any signs of SA and police also found her backpack nearby. Her mom said that the way they found her made it feel like she was in a movie. It was just something that she couldn't believe, you know, from the day Mikaela disappeared to finding the note to viewing the surveillance footage to finding the Facebook chat with Rochi to the arrest of Jonathan to then finding her body like this. She just said it felt like a horrible, horrible movie and it was all just too much. So after all of this, Jonathan was taken into custody and placed in preventative prison to await his trial. When the news got out about Jonathan killing Mikaela, around 50 people from his neighborhood actually set his home on fire. His home was being guarded by two policemen after Jonathan was arrested, but they weren't able to stop this huge mob of people from burning down his house. Authorities said that this incident didn't really affect the case because they had already collected all the evidence they needed and they had found Mikaela's body so it didn't really affect them that his house was burned down. However, a lot of people did feel sad about this because the house actually didn't belong to him. It was actually his girlfriend Maria's house that she paid for and worked to maintain and now she didn't have a home. Again, Jonathan didn't work or contribute any help to Maria financially so Maria Maria was just like, oh my god, like, first my boyfriend gets arrested for doing something so terrible, and then everyone burns my house down. So some people did feel bad for Maria, but other people did heavily criticize her for being the girlfriend of this killer. Maria spoke out about this and said that only God can judge, and she is in no way condoning what he did, and says that she has also suffered a lot at his hands as well. She said that she was only keeping quiet about her suspicions because of how violent he would be to her, and again, because he threatened and her children. She did give her condolences to the family and said that she is deeply sorry. As for Mikaela's funeral, it was held two days later on May 30th, 2016. It was a very tragic day for the family and for Mikaela's friends. People from the community gathered to show their support and offer their condolences to the family. It was a very rainy and cold day, but that didn't stop so many people from the community from showing up. People placed photos, cards, and flower bouquets as her coffin was being laid in the ground. Her parents said their last goodbye to their little girl and Monica said that she didn't want any parent to ever experience the pain of losing a child so she made it her goal to stop any other little girl or little boy from being a victim to an online predator. She was going to make sure that people would not forget about what happened to her daughter. In August of that year, Monica actually chained herself to the gates of the National Congress building. She was not going to move until she got a commitment from the government that preventative campaigns were going to be made in order to prevent grooming and restrict the temporary releases of convicted sexual abusers and killers. I mentioned earlier how Jonathan escaped after being let out on a temporary 24-hour release during his imprisonment where he was supposed to serve five years. He escaped from this temporary release and then he murdered Micaela. Monica doesn't understand why he was allowed this temporary leave because, you know, she truly feels like if he had stayed behind bars and served his sentence, then none of this would have ever happened. She also wanted the judge who allowed this temporary release named Juan to be held responsible for Micaela's death because he basically signed off on Jonathan being free. This is actually the third time that this judge authorized a criminal temporary release who ended up committing a homicide later on. In the end, this judge was suspended for 30 days and he actually went to trial for those two other cases, but eventually he was reinstated. Now, what really breaks my heart is that Monica also blames herself for Mikaela's death. She said, quote, I, as a mother, am responsible because I installed the internet in the house. I gave her a tablet and a computer without tools to defend herself. For there to be a true change, there always has to be a victim. And in this case, there was. And it was my daughter. This whole thing just really opened her eyes to the dangers of the internet. And she started working with organizations who talk about this very serious subject. You know, she spoke out and said that she always warned Mikaela about the dangers outside the home. You know, about stranger dangers on the streets or in school or anything, but she never thought to talk to Micaela about the dangers that could happen inside the home. Monica got really close with this organization called Mamas en Niña, which is formed of moms whose children were unfortunately victims of online grooming and murdered as well. They all joined together to have the same goal, you know, to save another child from falling victim to this again. Now, going back to Jonathan, his trial finally began in October of 2017. There were around nine 
90 people who testified at this trial. Among them were other girls who Jonathan spoke to online via his multiple accounts that spoke out and said that Jonathan always insisted on meeting them in person. His then 15-year-old neighbor that he was friends with also testified and said that Jonathan was very violent with his girlfriend Maria that he would tell her, when I get violent like that, hit me or something so I can snap out of it. This neighbor also said that Jonathan's behavior changed after Mikaela's disappearance was all over the news. He would basically tell everyone to be quiet so that he could listen to the news about Mikaela's disappearance and that he would also laugh and mock Mikaela's family for doing marches to spread awareness. She says that at one point, Jonathan even told her, quote, what happened to Mikaela happened to her because she didn't want to have sex end quote. Yeah, he was saying all of this and acting this way in front of his 15-year-old neighbor. Now, another girl who Jonathan would also speak to said that on May 21st, 2016, Jonathan asked her if she knew anyone who wanted to buy a hair straightener. We now know that the hair straightener he was trying to sell was Micaela's, which is just so sick. I mean, the fact that he stole her belongings after killing her and then tried to sell it to another young girl is just insane. I mean, all of these people that testified basically just showed how disgusting this man is and how evil, disturbing, and sick he is. After Jonathan murdered Micaela, he kept talking to girls on Facebook and just kept posting on Facebook like nothing had happened. In fact, 48 hours after Micaela's murder, he updated his status to say, like and I'll message you, I'm bored. Yeah, this man really typed I'm bored after murdering a young 12-year-old girl. Now, a couple of psychiatrists and psychologists spoke out during the trial and one psychiatrist named Enrique said that Jonathan has a high degree of danger to himself and others. He also said that he has a profile of someone who shows massive disdain for others and who is antisocial, irresponsible, and manipulative. Another expert opinion was from psychologist Lorena. Now, she considered Jonathan a threat and that he had a strategy in which he uses deception and simulation and then advances towards more offensive mechanisms such as manipulation, submission, and extortion. She also said that he can be described as a, quote, psychopath, a predator of his own species who uses personal charm, manipulation, intimidation, and violence to control others to satisfy his selfish needs, end quote. As for his defense, his defense team tried arguing arguing that Jonathan had very poor cognitive functions due to an injury he suffered when he was younger, which affected his decision-making, and that he should only serve 20 years and be treated by a psychiatrist. The trial only lasted around a week, and on October 19th, 2017, Jonathan was sentenced to life in prison. The judges determined that Jonathan killed Micaela to hide his crimes of grooming and theft after he didn't get what he wanted, which was to suck abuse Micaela. Jonathan made her walk nine kilometers to a hard to access and isolated area where he then tried, you know, essaying her. She rejected him and tried to defend herself and because she said no, he decided to rob her and then kill her. Monica and the rest of the family were extremely happy with the sentencing. It was actually the first sentencing in Argentina for grooming resulting in murder that was actually taken to trial and where the groomer was convicted. It was a really big deal and it was all all over the news. Micaela's dad said, quote, We are moved by this. It gives us a lot of strength that Mika's friends, family, and even people we don't know were there. It is something that helps us move forward. End quote. You know, during the trial, the family was very worried about his sentencing because, you know, we've seen it in a lot of cases where, unfortunately, the sentencing is kind of like a slap in the face to the victim's families, but thankfully, in this case, the judge ruled fairly. Monica could finally let out a deep sigh of relief knowing that her daughter killer was going to be away for the rest of his life. Now, unfortunately, this sense of relief was kind of temporary because later on, Monica got some very upsetting news. She found out that Jonathan had a cell phone in prison and that he opened up a brand new Facebook account, which he was using to once again message young females. He was actually posting selfies in his jail cell and he was even posting photos with the cellmate. Monica just could not believe what she was hearing. Like, how is it possible that this guy was allowed 
allowed to have a cell phone when a cell phone is literally this man's biggest weapon. She was so angry and was so scared that he was going to cause harm to another young girl from his prison cell. She just felt like it was so disrespectful to her, to Micaela, and to all the other victims out there that Jonathan was allowed a cell phone again. Unfortunately, Micaela's family was once again outraged in 2023 with something new about Jonathan. Jonathan is now saying that he identifies as a woman and he was requesting to be transferred to a woman's cell. He changed his name to Joanna and has been speaking to his lawyers about this change. His lawyers can now request to reclassify his crime as a simple homicide instead of a femicide, which could possibly reduce his sentence. Argentina has a self-identification law that states men who identify as women cannot be charged with femicide. Jonathan says that he identified as a woman at the time that he committed the crime, so he should have been charged as a woman. So while things are being processed and while all of this is being figured out, he has been placed in a transgender sector of the prison and as of now, everyone is kind of just waiting for an update as to what's going to happen, you know? Is he going to get a new sentence? Is this going to affect the case? Like, what is going to happen? According to law professor and public defender Jose Crosito, he thinks that Jonathan is, quote, finding a way to scam the court. The gender identity law does not require any type of psychological evaluation because it is intended to be inclusive. Although he doesn't believe that it will impact his life sentence, he could be given certain benefits in jail. Monica says that she wasn't even notified about Jonathan's new identity, which actually goes against the victim law that states families of the victims need to be notified of any legal movements regarding the case. The only way she found out about this, you know, about the fact that Jonathan was now a girl, was actually through the media. And she said, quote, I will not allow him to be with women. He hates women. It has been proven with the psychological and psychiatric tests that were carried out on him. He despises the female sex, end quote. She also said that Jonathan is a master manipulator, as she has seen through the messages he would send Micaela, and that he is now basically manipulating the law. As of now, there is no talk of hormonal treatments for Jonathan while he's behind bars, but again, we will see what happens with that, and I will definitely update you guys as soon as I know anything. Micaela's family is still fighting today to stop online grooming, and they're never going to stop. Monica has become a huge advocate, and in November of 2020, a huge step forward was made. A new law in Micaela's name was made called Le Micaela. This new law actually created the organization National Program for the Prevention and Awareness of Grooming or Cyberbullying Against Girls, Boys, and Adolescents. The goal of this organization is to protect against grooming, to educate young people how to use the internet responsibly, to equip school teachers and professionals who work with children with tools to prevent grooming, and to assist in reporting any grooming cases. Monica said, quote, it's about giving kids what my daughter was denied, that in a matter of hours, we can know who is on the other side of the computer. It took 32 days in my case. We know Jonathan is in jail, but there are many other Jonathans loose and going after our boys and girls, end quote. Monica's dedication to making sure no family loses a loved one to online grooming is incredibly admirable. I'm sure it's not easy for her to continue speaking about this after what happened to her daughter, but the fact that she's willing to do this and is willing to put herself out there just shows how incredibly strong she is. My heart goes out to Micaela's family. What happened to her is just absolutely terrible. It breaks my heart that she thought that she was going with a friend, with someone that she trusted, but instead was betrayed and just killed in such a horrific way. Micaela was so young, you know, she had so much life ahead of her, and I just truly hope that she is resting peacefully now. As I mentioned at the start of the video, I will have some resources down below about how to approach this topic, about about internet safety and things like that. So I highly encourage you guys to check out the links down below. We all need to work together to protect our loved ones from the evils online. And it's just really scary out there. So definitely have these talks with the people in your life and definitely just stay safe online. I think that is pretty much everything I have for today's video. I know it's such an upsetting case, but like I mentioned, I feel like it's very important to talk about this and to continue to spread awareness. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to today's video. I truly appreciate you guys so much and I will see you all in the next video. Bye everyone!